This is the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter, 2021. Lesson 4 for April 17 to 23, An Everlasting Covenant, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 17. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come once again as we're studying your word and we are looking at the covenants and we're now studying the everlasting covenant. We pray that as we open your word, your Holy Spirit will help each of us as we read, as we listen, as we think about this, that we may gain a deeper understanding, but that also we may become part of that everlasting covenant and have it applied in our lives. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 17 and verse 7. I, that is God, will establish my covenant between me and you, that's Abraham, and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Let's read that again, Genesis 17, verse 7. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. How many remember distinctly in childhood a sickness or a touch of pneumonia that made us very ill, with the potential for something even worse? In the long, feverish night, we would awaken from a half-sleep to see our mother or father sitting in a chair beside our bed in the soft glow of the night light. Just so, in a figurative human sense, God sat by the bedside of a sin-sick world as moral darkness began to deepen in the centuries after the flood. For this reason... He called out Abram and planned to establish through his faithful servant a people to whom he could entrust a knowledge of himself and give salvation. Therefore, God entered into a covenant with Abram and his posterity that emphasized in more detail the divine plan to save humankind from the results of sin. The Lord was not going to leave his world unattended, not with it in such dire need. This week, we will look at the unfolding of more covenant promises. And so for the week at a glance. What is the name of God? What does it mean? What was the significance of the names God used to identify himself to Abram? What names did he use to identify himself? Why did God change Abram's name to Abraham? Why are names important? And what conditions or obligations were attached to the covenant? Sunday, April 18, Yahweh and the Abrahamic Covenant. Genesis 15, 7 reads, And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. Names can sometimes be like trademarks. They become so closely associated in our minds with certain characteristics that when we hear the name, we immediately recall those traits. What traits come to mind, for instance, when you think of these names? Albert Einstein, Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, or Dorcas. Each one is associated with certain characteristics and ideals. During Bible times, people of the Near East attached great importance to the meaning of names. The Hebrews always thought of a name as indicating either the personal characteristics of the one named, or the thoughts and emotions of the one given the name, or attendant circumstances at the time the name was given. We read on page 523 of volume 1 of the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary. When God first entered into a covenant relationship with Abram, he made himself known to the patriarch under the name Yahweh. That's capital Y, capital H, capital W, capital H. 
Y-H-W-H, pronounced Yahweh and translated as Lord in capitals in the King James Version, as we've just read in verse 7 of chapter 15 of Genesis. Thus, Genesis 15 reads literally, I am Yahweh who brought thee out of. The name Yahweh, though appearing 6,828 times in the Old Testament, is somewhat shrouded in mystery. It seems to be a form of the verb Haya, to be, in which case it would mean the Eternal One, the Existent One, the Self-Existent One, the Self-Sufficient One, or the One who lives eternally. The divine attributes that seem to be emphasised by this title are those of self-existence and faithfulness. They point to the Lord as the living God, the source of life, in contrast with the gods of the heathen, which had no existence apart from the imagination of their worshippers. God himself explains the meaning of Yahweh in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. This meaning expresses the reality of God's unconditioned existence, while it also suggests his rule over past, present and future. Yahweh also is God's personal name. The identification of Yahweh as the one who brought Abram out of Ur refers to the announcement of God's covenant with him in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, which reads, now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. God wants Abram to know his name, because that name reveals aspects of his identity, personal nature and character, and from this knowledge we can learn to trust in his promises, as we read in Psalm 9.10, And those who know your name will put their trust in you, for you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you, and Psalm 91.14, Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, I will set him on high, because he has known my name. And so to finish today. When you think of or hear the name Yahweh, what traits or characteristics automatically come to mind? Those of love, kindness and care, or those of fear, strictness and discipline? What thoughts automatically come to mind when you think of the name Jesus? Monday, April 19, El Shaddai. And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, we read in Genesis 17, 1, The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. Yahweh had appeared to Abram several times before, as we've read in uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And in the same chapter, verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And Genesis 13 verse 14, And the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now, and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. And Genesis 15, 1, After these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. And verse 7. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And verse 18. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with 
Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, in the above text, Yahweh again appears to Abram. The Lord appeared to Abram, presenting himself as Almighty God, a name that is used with two exceptions only in the books of Genesis and Job. The name Almighty God consists first of El, that's E-L, the basic name for God used among the Semites. Though the exact meaning of Shaddai is not entirely certain, the translation Almighty seems the most accurate, as we read in Isaiah 13, verse 6, Wail, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. And Joel 1, verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. The crucial idea is the use of this name seems to be that of contrasting the might and power of God with the weakness and frailty of humanity. Question, read Genesis 17, verses 1 through to 6, which helps place everything in the larger context. Why would the Lord at this time want to stress to Abram his might and power? What was God saying that would require Abram to trust in that might and power? Look particularly at verse 6. Genesis 17, beginning at verse 1. When Abram was ninety-nine years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. A literal translation of chapter 17, verses 1 to 6, would be, Jehovah appeared to Abram and said, I am El Shaddai, walk before me, and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly, and thou shall be a father of a multitude of nations, and I will make thee exceedingly fruitful. This same name also appears in Genesis 28 and verse 3. May God Almighty bless you and, may, and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may be an assembly of peoples. This is where Isaac says that El Shaddai will bless Jacob, make him fruitful and multiply him. A similar promise of El Shaddai is found in Genesis 35.11. Also God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall proceed from you, and kings shall come from your body. And Genesis 43 verse 14. And may God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that he may release your other brother and Benjamin. If I am bereaved, I am bereaved. And Genesis forty nine twenty five, By the God of your Father, who will help you, and by the Almighty, who will bless you, with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb. These passages suggest the bountifulness exercised by God. L the God of power and authority, and Shaddai, the God of inexhaustible riches, riches that he is willing to bestow upon those who seek him in faith and obedience. And so to finish the day, it has been said that a rose by any other name would smell as sweet, the idea being that the name does not matter. Yet how much comfort and hope would you have if the Lord's name was the frail God or the weak God? 
Look at the text for today. Replace Almighty God with these two other names. What would it do for your faith and trust in Him if the Lord were to present Himself to us in that manner? At the same time, how does the name El Shaddai give us comfort? Tuesday, April 20, from Abram to Abraham. Our text for today is Genesis 17, verses 4 and 5. As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Though the names of God come with spiritual and theological significance, such usage does not end with God alone. Names of people in the ancient Near East were not just meaningless forms of identification, as often they are to us. To name a girl Mary or Susie does not make much of a difference today. For the ancient Semites, however, human names came heavy laden with spiritual significance. All Semitic names of people have meaning, and usually consist of a phrase or short sentence comprised of a wish or an expression of gratitude on the part of the parent. For example, Daniel means, God is my judge, Joel means, Yahweh is God, and Nathan means, gift of God. Because of the significance attached to names, names would often be changed to reflect a radical change in someone's life and circumstances. Question. Look up the following texts. What situations are they addressing and why were the names changed in these situations? First of all, Genesis 32 and verse 28. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. And Genesis 41, verse 45, And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zephna-Parnia, and he gave him as a wife Azana, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Daniel 1, verse 7. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. In one sense, however, it is not that hard even for modern minds to understand the significance of what a person is called. There are subtle and at times not so subtle effects. If someone is constantly called stupid or ugly, and if those are the appellations used for them all the time by a lot of people, sooner or later those names could have an impact on how the person views himself or herself. In the same way, by giving people certain names or changing their names, it seems possible to influence how they would view themselves and thus influence how they would act. With this in mind, it is not so hard to understand why God would want to change Abram to Abraham. Abram means father is exalted. God changed it to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. When you look at the covenant promise in which God says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you, in Genesis 17 verse 6, the name change makes more sense. Perhaps it was God's way of helping Abraham trust in the covenant promise, which was being made to a 99-year-old man married to an old woman who had up until this time been barren. In short, God did it to help increase Abraham's faith in God's promises to him.
Wednesday, April 21, Covenant Stages. Our text for today is Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. In those two verses, the first stage of God's covenant promise to Abram, there are three, is revealed. God approached Abram, gave him a command, and then made a promise. The approach expresses God's gracious election of Abram to be the first major figure of his special covenant of grace. The command involves the test of total trust in God, as we read in Hebrews 11 verse 8, By faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. The promise, found in Genesis 12, 1-3, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land which I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Though made specifically to Abram's descendants, ultimately includes a promise to the whole human race. As we read in Genesis 12, verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And Galatians 3, verses 6 to 9, just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Question. The second stage of God's covenant with Abram appears in Genesis 15, verses 7 to 18. In what verses do we find some of the same steps that appeared in the first stage? Let's read those verses, Genesis fifteen seven to 18. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? So he said to him, Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two down in the middle and placed each piece opposite the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abram, Know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and will serve them, and they will afflict them four hundred years. And also the nation whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions." Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace, you shall be buried at a good old age, but in the fourth generation they shall return there, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And it came to pass, when the sun went down and it was dark, that, behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I will give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. 
Now, the question is, where do we find the approach of God to man? In which verses? Well, I think it's probably at the beginning. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord, how shall I know that I will inherit it? And then the call to human obedience. So let's see, where do we find that? I guess that's where he starts in verse 9 to tell him to bring the three-year-old heifer, the three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he did that and he brought those and the sacrifice occurred. And then the divine promise occurs. Well, where's that? Verse Verse 18, to your descendants I will give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. In the solemn ritual of the second stage, the Lord appeared to Abram and passed between the carefully arranged pieces of animals. Each of the three animals was slaughtered and divided and the two halves were placed one against the other with a space between. The birds were killed but not divided those entering into the covenant were to walk between the divided pieces, symbolically vowing perpetual obedience to the provisions thus solemnly agreed upon. Question. Describe what took place during the third and final stage of divine covenant-making with Abraham. See Genesis 17 verses 1 to 14. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who was born in your house, and he who was bought with your money, must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child, who was not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The meaning of the name Abraham underscores God's desire and design to save all peoples. The many nations would include both Jews and Gentiles. The New Testament makes it abundantly clear that the true descendants of Abraham are those who have the faith of Abraham and who trust in the merits of the promised Messiah, as we read in Galatians 3, verse 7 and verse 29. Verse 7 reads, Therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And verse 29 of Galatians chapter 3, And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Thus, as far back as Abraham, the Lord's intention was to save as many human beings as he could, whatever nations they lived in. No doubt it's no different today. And so to finish today, 
Read Revelation 14, verses 6 to 7, the first angel's message. What parallels can you find between what the angel is saying and what happened in the Abrahamic covenant? In what ways are the issues the same? Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water. Thursday, April 22. Covenant Obligations. Genesis chapter 18, verse 19 reads, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. As we have seen so far, the covenant is always a covenant of grace, of God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. There is no exception in the covenant with Abraham. In his grace, God had chosen Abraham as his instrument to assist in proclaiming the plan of salvation to the world. God's fulfilment of his covenant promises was, however, linked to Abraham's willingness to do righteously and to obey him by faith. Without that obedience on Abraham's part, God could not use him. Genesis 18.19 demonstrates how grace and law are related. It opens with grace, I know him, and is followed by the fact that Abraham is someone who will obey the Lord and have his family obey as well. Faith and works, then, appear here in a close union, as they must, as we read in James 2 and verse 17. Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Notice, however, the phrasing of Genesis 18 verse 19, particularly the last clause. What is it saying here about Abraham's obedience? For I know him, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of the Lord, to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Though obedience is not the means of salvation, what importance is it given here? According to this text, could the covenant be fulfilled without it? Explain your answer. The blessings of the covenant could not be enjoyed or maintained unless certain conditions were met by the beneficiaries. Though the conditions were not needed to establish a covenant, meeting them was to be the response of love, faith and obedience. It was to be a, the manifestation of a relationship between humankind and God. Obedience was the means by which God could fulfil his covenant promises to the people. Covenant breaking, through disobedience, is unfaithfulness to an established relationship. When the covenant is broken, what is broken is not the condition of bestowal, but the condition of fulfilment. So to finish today, in your own experience with the Lord, can you see why obedience is so important? Can you think of any examples, either from the Bible or from your own experience, where disobedience makes the fulfilment of covenant promises impossible? If so, what are they? And more important, what is the remedy?
Friday, April 23. The rainbow is a sign of God's covenant with Noah. Read Genesis 17.10 to discover what was the sign of God's covenant with Abraham. Genesis 17, verse 10, This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. And then we read in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 1, pages 322 to 323, Circumcision was destined, one, to distinguish the seed of Abraham from the Gentiles, as we read in Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands. Two, to perpetuate the memory of Jehovah's covenant in Genesis 17.11, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Three, to foster the cultivation of moral purity, as you read in Deuteronomy 10.16. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart, and be stiff-necked no longer. And four, to represent righteousness by faith, as we read in Romans 4.11. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had, while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And five, to symbolize circumcision of the heart. Romans 2.29 But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. And six, to foreshadow the Christian rite of baptism, as you read in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. End of quote. The rainbow will remain as a sign of God's promise until the end of the world. But the sign of circumcision will not. According to the Apostle Paul, circumcision was received by Abraham as a token of the righteousness he had received by faith in God, as we've already read in Romans 4 verse 11. However, through the centuries, circumcision came to signify salvation by obedience to the law. By New Testament times, circumcision had lost its biblical significance. Instead, the essential element is faith in Jesus Christ, which leads to an obedient, transformed life. As we read in Galatians 5 and verse 6, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. And Galatians 6.15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And 1 Corinthians 7, 18 and 19. Was anyone called while circumcised? Let him not become uncircumcised. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God is what matters. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. 1. Discuss the relationship between faith and works. Can there be one without the other? If not, why not? 2. A quote from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126 and 127. Many are still tested, as was Abraham. They do not hear the voice of God speaking directly from the heavens, but he calls them by the teachings of his word and the events of his providence. They may be required 
to abandon a career that promises wealth and honour, to leave congenial and profitable associations and separate from kindred, to enter upon what appears to be only a path of self-denial, hardship and sacrifice. God has a work for them to do, but a life of ease and the influence of friends and kindred would hinder the development of the very traits essential for its accomplishment. He calls them away from human influences and aid and leads them to feel the need of his help and to depend upon him alone, that he may reveal himself to them. Who is ready at the call of providence to renounce cherished plans and familiar associations? End of quote. Discuss any contemporary examples of those you know who heeded this same call. And to summarise this week's lesson, God called Abraham into a special relationship with him, one that would reveal the plan of salvation to the world. Inside Story. Our mission story this week is titled God Always Has a Way, and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. David never cared about God until he lost his business to his best friend amid a bitter court battle. All hope seemed lost. He decided to study theology at a Seventh day Adventist college in the Philippines. David, who grew up in an affluent family, had no desire to become a minister. He simply wanted to gain a better understanding of God. David moved from his atheistic homeland to the Philippines. For his personal safety, Adventist Mission is not identifying David by his full name or providing some other details. After months of theology classes, David was still wondering whether he had a future when he joined a mandatory month-long evangelistic campaign, part of the requirement for his education. He preached evenings and spoke one-on-one -on -one with attendees. One schoolteacher told him that she had longed to be baptised for many years, but feared that her husband would kill her if she became a Christian. At her request, David began Bible studies. Finally, she was baptised. "'Aren't you afraid that your husband will kill you?' David asked afterward. "'He may kill me,' the woman replied, "'but I still wanted to be baptised.' David was astonished by her faith in the face of death. He had never seen such faith. Her husband did not kill her. David also befriended a boy who came every night and wanted to be baptised. David went to the boy's house to ask for permission, but the parents, who belonged to another Christian denomination, turned him away. David visited many times, but the parents would not relent. Six months later, an Adventist pastor sought out David at the college to tell an unusual story. A family of four showed up at his church one Sabbath and asked to be baptised. He quizzed the parents, son and daughter about their knowledge of the Bible and saw that they understood the church's beliefs. But he couldn't figure out how they knew the Bible so well. No local church members knew the family and no one had given them Bible studies. Finally, the pastor asked, How did you hear about the Adventist church? Evangelistic meetings were held in our town six months ago, the father said. A foreigner came to our house many times to talk about our son, who wanted to be baptised. We strongly opposed his baptism. But, after six months of consideration, our whole family has decided to join the church. David couldn't believe his ears. He realised that God always has a way, even when everything seems hopeless. He gave his heart to Jesus and became a pastor. My life has been a journey, he said. I have learned to trust God and to work for him. 
This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.